Welcome, everybody. My name is Jared from Brickhouse Media. We do custom multimedia marketing in the Bay Area and beyond. We work with thought leaders. Uh, we work with marketing experts, startups, entrepreneurs, and founders of companies. Recently, we came across some work that we found really interesting, and we wanted to interview this expert to learn more about how she weaves uh, ancient philosophy, uh, which is now modern philosophy also, because we're still using it, into her uh, business and strategy work, working with clients and companies. So welcome, Christina. Thank you for joining us. This is Christina Hi, Giacomo. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. It's nice to be here. I'm, I'm excited. Thank you for the invite. You're welcome. Where are you today? Where in the world are you today? I am in Queens, New York City. All right. And how is the weather and life in Queens right now? It's beautiful. The weather is beautiful. Yeah. Good. And, and it's, and everything, New York is very, is very chill right now. That's good. We, we're okay with chill. We can use a little bit more chill, right? Chill's okay. Um, so tell people a little bit about yourself and what we're going to be talking about today. Sure. So, you know, my backstory is really around having this career in, in advertising and marketing uh, for close to 20 years. And about 10 years ago, I started studying philosophy just, just because I, I, needed, I needed really something outside of the advertising and marketing field. And I was always very curious about philosophy. And uh, I ended up taking to it and really enjoying it and really getting into it. And so uh, eventually, uh, about a year and a half ago, I decided, you know, why can't I figure out a way to apply philosophy for the workplace? And so essentially what I did is I took this background uh, in advertising and marketing, which, was, which is basically all the horror stories and war stories and battle scars from being in, in the you know, in corporate and in agency life and 10 years of study in philosophy and understanding and really practicing and applying like what it means to live a good life and, and be a good person and also getting a degree in organizational change management. So understanding this is when you're talking about a great workplace, this is what this means. And so at some point I wanted out of advertising and marketing as a field, but I had all of this experience. And so how could I use it to maybe help people? And so I mashed up all these three things, organizational change, philosophy, and understanding what it means to be in the working world. And I created this category called industrial philosophy. And essentially, I work with business leaders and teams who are experiencing change or they have big questions about what to do next or they might be experiencing a challenge. And I draw on philosophy and philosophical principles to help them think differently, to maybe help them have a more open uh, idea of what they could do next and help them see things in a different way. Uh, and so that's really what I do with my company, Moralchemy. It's an advising firm. And I just basically apply philosophy for the workplace. Uh, my belief is that wisdom is the ultimate skill. You know, if you, if you are a wise person, you are adaptable, you have high EQ, you are productive, you are resilient, you are all the things that anyone could ever want to either be or uh, the kind of person you would want to work with. And all of that ladders up to, to being wise. And that's why I believe that wisdom is the ultimate skill. Got it. So, Thank you. That's a perfect introduction. And I like how you compounded all the different elements into wise and wisdom. And it's a really nice encompassing uh, way to describe all those elements that are needed in the process. And how do you describe alchemy to people? Because I find that that word is, is a little bit more nebulous around alchemy. So, well, alchemy as 
what it originally was was just turning turning is was a metallurgy kind of uh science and i i'm using air quotes because it was never actually you know it's just people really trying very hard to turn certain metals in into gold but what came out of that was this notion of transformation and this idea of transformation and so if you look at the word alchemy uh in sort of a broader context you see uh different aspects of change transformation going from one state that is maybe not ideal to a golden state i mean there's definitely different uh different symbolism depending on how um depending on how you look at it for me it's a word that also implies let's put things in the mix let's let's get a mix going let's look at different things let's question let's you know examine and see what good things can come out of that examination and so that's what alchemy means to me Cool. So I think we're going to be doing some alchemy today and we're going to be examining some ideas and I'm going to kind of play devil's advocate a little bit on the marketing front and from the small business owner and the entrepreneur and the startup mindset, like how could we adapt some of these things? How could we integrate some of this work in our day to day strategy or stepping back, kind of looking at things a little bit bigger picture. So take it away. Thank you. So as the title of this presentation indicated, uh, Plato on advertising, I, you know, spent a lot of time reading Plato and understanding his ideas. And sometimes I found uh, his ideas really helpful, even in understanding principles of marketing or advertising, which you might think would be kind of strange, but it's you know, it's something that I used when I was at the New York Times. I actually started the brand strategy department at the New York Times. And so I found Plato's ideas and specifically what I'm going to talk about today uh, is his allegory of the cave, particularly useful in the challenges that I was experiencing and really trying to, and really understanding the role of marketing and understanding the role of advertising. Because even as an experienced person in that field, sometimes the, 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 it kind of blended together and I was always not sure when advertising should step in or when marketing should step in and where was brand in all of this. And I know that's still a, lot, a challenge for a lot of people. Uh, so I found this rubric for uh, for, the, for the way I can describe it, using Plato's allegory of the cave to help me remember when I was in a marketing uh, process and when I was in an advertising process. And that's what I'm going to share with you today. So a little bit about Plato. Uh, you know, if, if you are familiar, he's an ancient Greek philosopher and he wrote The Republic, which is this dialogue that talked about you know, what it meant to be a just person, what it meant to have a good society. And in it, he wrote about this uh, story or this extended metaphor. It's called the allegory of the cave. And, and some people may actually be familiar with it. It's, it's pretty famous, but I'll go through all of that um, to, and explain it. And so we see some artifacts from the allegory of the cave. Like when someone says to you, you know, I wish that person would see the light or stop living in a cave. These are artifacts in our contemporary culture and in our contemporary vernacular that are artifacts of the allegory of the cave. So I mentioned those things because you probably said those things before. And I have, and I actually thought they were probably a religious, I thought, I, I, I would guess, if I had to guess, I would say it was a religious background, see the light, the light of, um, you know, when you die, people talk about seeing the light and this golden heavenly angelic light. And then also the cave, I studied anthropology, so I was thinking more like cavemen, like crawling out of the cave to create culture. 
and that in the darkness of the cave, there's not a lot of creativity and culture. So two things. For living in the cave, Plato was referring to his, history, right? So yes, he used those elements in the cave. As far as the religious connotation, you know, philosophy and religion were very intertwined, especially um, in, in ancient Greece and during the, um, the Renaissance period and the med medieval period. So yeah, absolutely, there, there's probably, um, there's some sort of linguistic tie uh, together, but the, the way I see these artifacts are also tied to the allegory of the cave. But you're so good, Jared. You're so well read. I knew, I knew this would be great. So anyway. Thank so, you. <laughs> there's, so many, there's so many applications to the allegory of the cave. You'll notice this as we go through this, but particularly for the discussion, we're going to just focus on how I used it in uh, my time in advertising and how it could help people um, in that field. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is just talk about the allegory of the cave. So you're familiar, so you become more familiar with this story. So Jared, I'm gonna walk you through a few visual panels and, and whoever is watching this, a few visual panels. And I'm gonna ask yeah. you some questions as we go through. Okay, Jared, so yeah. I'm gonna just move this. Okay, so here is the beginning of the story of the cave. What do you see here? I see men uh, bound and tied to a rod or, or wooden pole with uh, shackles around their feet and also around their neck. And they're ex almost excitedly looking up at some, what I would say is looks like kind of artwork or paintings on the wall of a horse and a dog or maybe a coyote or a wolf. Excellent. So, okay. Based on the story, one day, one of these, one of these people um, realizes that they can actually stand up. And they can stand up and look around. So now, Jared, what do you see here? Oh, it changes the whole thing. Um, now, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm pretending to be one of these men, I can stand up and see, oh, these are shadows, these are wall shadows cast by the firelight. And there's, looks like uh, Grecian women kind of marching a story along the walls to tell a story using the shadow work. Excellent. So let's say you're this person who all your life were just looking at these pictures on this wall and you turn around behind this wall and learn that everything that you were looking at was created, um, it was just a shadow uh, on a wall. And so you'd probably be pretty surprised. You probably then would feel, oh, well maybe, you know, there's clearly more to what I'm seeing and what I'm experiencing than what I had was experiencing previously. So the story continues. It kind of what reminds me here? a little bit of the wizard behind the curtain. You're, you're taking yeah. some of the magic is gone, but then there's all this new reality um, that is popping in. And so now if, you know, we're saying the man is free to walk around and see now it's like, whoa, there's a whole new world coming, at, coming into view. What does that maybe look like? That's correct. He sees behind, you know, the, the urn with the flames, another light. There's a little bit more light. So he sees an opening and begins to walk towards it. And now what do you see, Jared? Oh, now it's like going from the darkness into this beautiful natural scene with sunlight and nature and ocean and water and trees and rocks and it's like the real world instead of the make-believe world that was being shown to him is now 
right in front of him and he's experiencing it, not just uh, being shown it. Exactly. So now he steps outside and realizes that he's been seeing and living in an experience that wasn't true and that there's this whole other truth um, in this whole other world uh, that's actually taking place outside of this cave. So naturally, he's super excited about it and wants to go back and tell his buddies back inside the cave everything that he's seen. And so this is where the story of the allegory of the cave begins to draw to a close because he does go back to tell his friends that are, that are looking at the shadows all about a tree and a sun and the outside world. And his friends um, don't understand what he's talking about because they haven't experienced what he's experiencing. So they, they just become very scared and frightened. So that's the full story of the allegory of the cave. And essentially what Plato wanted for us to understand was that this is the process of the education or the enlightenment of a person. They go from one understanding of truth to a whole other understanding of truth. Each step along the way, new information of their truth begins to be revealed. And so when I first really started studying the allegory of the cave, I was going through this period in my career at the New York Times where I really wanted, I really wanted to make change. And I, I had this idea to start a brand strategy competency at the New York Times. And I used this allegory as my way of shepherding this idea throughout the organization. In addition, it helped me explain the, from a brand strategy perspective, the role of marketing and the role of advertising. And that's what I'm going to get into next. Any questions, Jared? Comments? No, got it. I, it, you know, it's, it's, triggering different ideas for me about how people share when they get that breakthrough moment and they feel compelled to share and they want to go, like when you said he wants to go back and tell his friends. And it's such a powerful thing in our current modern marketing of how do ideas get shared? How do new perspectives, new perspectives and things like that get shared once people have seen the light? Um, of something new and something exciting and something they want to share about. So I'm excited for you to dive in next. Great. So now that we know this story, there's a question. Yep. What if everything that you've just seen this story could also represent a customer journey? So we now take a look at the allegory in a little bit more of a practical way and when I realized this is actually could be the model for a customer journey. So you have a target audience that, you know, they have a certain reality that they're, that they're looking in you as the brand, you've seen the light, you know, you already, you know, your product really well, you're in the land of sunshine, but you have this target audience that is in this completely different reality. And so the question then becomes, what is their journey in understanding or becoming more, having a better, more of an affinity for your brand given their reality and what are the truth points? Like we talk about touch points. I think they should be called truth points. And so, you know, what are the truth points along the way in their customer journey as they begin to become more familiar with your brand? So that's the question uh, that's in front of us. I got it. And I, I would say if, if, if you don't feel like things are truthful at those touch points, you're not going to continue down that journey. So you have to build that trust and that's where the brand comes in and that's where the messaging alignment has to be on point. 
because you're developing that trust. So I think the trust at each touch point is really critical. Jared, thank you so much for saying that because I think that's a really big challenge. Uh, and I see a lot of marketers, I mean, I get marketed at all the time and I all see us, a yeah. lot of marketers and brands who don't do a good job of just being truthful. And I think there's a lot of lip service around being authentic as a brand and having an authentic voice. And, and I think there are hits, there are hits and misses around that. Um, but you know, to your point, absolutely tell the truth at every point. People know when you're telling the truth. That's why this process works. That's why if you want them to become truly aligned with your brand, to really see your brand purely, to be an advocate for it, you have to tell the truth the whole time. You got so it. truth points, not touch truth points. Truth points. I like that. Cool. Okay. So, so then, you know, what is marketing in this whole model? And so I started to think about, I realized like marketing is really truly understanding. It's the process of understanding what their reality is and what are the truths that are lying underneath that reality. So I drew a little diagram here just to illustrate how the allegory of the cave plays here. So, you know, we have them, they're looking at shadows. What the, so the questions from a marketing perspective, what are their shadows? So let's say, let's use social media as an example, right? Mm -hmm. So you have people who are consuming social media, really active in social media, completely think that social media is their reality, is reality, right? So as a brand, you know, if that, if you want to understand their reality, you have to understand what they're seeing in this social media context. What are the stories they're telling about them, you know, to themselves? What are maybe some of the lies that they're believing? What are their shadows? Um, you know, Jared, I don't know if there's anything else you want to add, but the whole point is from a, the marketing role at this stage of the customer journey is to understand their reality as well as you possibly can. Well, it reminds me of so many ads as a style that try to describe the pain point or the challenge of your reality right now. And that's often where they start their journey in their branding and marketing is how you are here and it hurts. You are here and you're dealing with this pain point. And then we move you through the, the process, but they really want to get into that. Um, you know, like, why does it hurt right now? Like, why is it dark and not working for you right now, the way you're doing it now? Excellent. Yes, that's a great example. And so, you know, again, sticking with the marketing process, if we understand their shadows, right, or what they think their reality is, then there's an underlying truth to that reality. There might actually even be a deeper pain there might actually even and 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 again when we talk about pain points we're not we're not necessarily trying to to do sort of this kind of desperate messaging where it's like you know we're not trying to get people to feel bad mm. we're just trying to communicate the insight that is so deep and so understood by that brand that it gets that person to to really, you know, make transform, but we'll get to that in a minute. Mm -hmm. So from a marketing, the marketing role at the stage of the shadows where they, you know, they finally see, you know, that, that there's a whole other truth is that there's actually a deeper truth. So perhaps you're eating a lot and you're gaining weight, you know, or you're not, you know, you realize maybe you should get off of social media, right? The deeper truth would be you don't feel good about yourself. 
And that is a marketer's job is to not only understand the pain point, but what is the truth underneath that pain point? Yeah. And there's only about five or 10 of those that all of them kind of fit in those buckets, um, you know, of a deeper core, core desire, that deeper core desire of what's, what's the issue there. Exactly. And so true, Jared. And I think you would agree that so that a lot of times I don't, at least I don't even see, I don't see brands even getting to that deeper truth. They kind of stay in that shadow land, you know, like you want to lose weight because you want to look good because you want to get the guy, right? It's Where a little it, too much before and after. Here's your problem now, here's your after. And they're skipping the deeper truth because that yes. is hard. It's a harder conversation and it takes more time and it takes more um, empathy, compassion, uh, patience to help people along that journey. Um, there's not many brands that have done that well, but they've done it in a way that have moved them from A to B or sorry, A to C, I would say, and they skip B and they're just jumping you or maybe we call it Z at this point because there's so much detail in those stories. But yeah, if, I think with 80 slim fast, you're overweight, here's lose weight. Here's, here's the, the overweight person and the thin person. And it's like, well, wait a minute, what happened in between? Convenience, emotions, all the other things that took place to make all those choices um, to get you to that person who's committed to losing that weight. Absolutely. Um, I, I'm so glad that you, you see that. Uh, and yes, it, it, it takes a little bit more research, maybe more focus groups, maybe yeah. actually hiring a person who's a real like consumer insights person, being more patient with your, uh, you know, with, with understanding who your target audience really is. And all, yes, all of this takes time, but what you're cultivating is you're cultivating something really valuable and that's a relationship and a relationship that's going to last for a long time. And so depending on your strategy as a brand, you know, absolutely. You want to fill, if you want to fill that pipeline, that before and after is, you know, certainly the way to go. But the problem that I've seen back in my advertising days is then is that retention is a B in, you know what I mean? And you do not have the level of retention that you want to have. Um, so anyway, and we can, and I'll show you more when I get into the advertising part of this, this story, but essentially understanding their shadows, what is the real underlying human truth in their reality? And then what would reality based on that truth, the real reality that would get them to, to feel good, to, to stick around, like what would that reality look, look like? And again, this is where consumer research really becomes important because that's where you're going to learn all of these three things. Anything else on the marketing aspect of the allegory of the cave before we get into advertising? No, I'm clear. Let's jump into advertising. Okay, excellent. So remember the part of the story where, um, you know, the, the person who's been outside, right? So now in this part of the marketing part, it's you, the brand, right? So then what is advertising? Advertising is really when you have to start talking to your audience. Now, remember the part of the story where the person that's been outside sees this sun and this the beach. I mean, it's like it's paradise, and they have to and they want to go back and talk to you know, talk to the people who are in the cave, and it's like they're speaking gibberish because they're talking about this awesome place and the 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 people in the cave are like wait what are shadows you're telling me i'm looking at shadows what are shadows so you can see the completely two different worlds and that's what's happening with a lot of brands when they're trying to talk to 
their prospective audience or customers. They're talking to them as if they know or have any idea about this world that this brand lives in. So then what is advertising? Advertising is what the brand says to get them to look up, okay? It's what you say. Now that you know what their shadows are, it's what you say to them to get them to look up, which is not based on your reality. It's based on what you understand their reality to be. So back to our model. Oh, Jared, did you want to say something? No, I was just saying, and, you know, look behind you and look around you and look like look at every direction because they're already entranced and, 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 uh, kind of, uh, I would say, narrowly focused at what they're seeing in front of them. It's that perspective. They don't have perspective. Excellent. Yeah. Exactly. So, you know, as a brand, you know, now if you're using this allegory, right, as, as, a, as a way to, um, as, as a model, you know now you can't go back to these you can't go back to these people and start talking to them about you know what life is like to be skinny you can't go back and talk to them about what life is like when they spend you know all day being super productive and and getting stuff done because they're not on social media it's like completely overwhelming so what do you say it's just that one thing to get them to look up. It's, it's that, you know, for, for someone who's looking to, to lose weight, it's, hey, how, how would it feel for you to just be able to like walk up a flight of steps? Uh, mm. It's just a hypothetical, right? Mm -hmm. Just a little step. Same thing with social media. Hey, how would, it, like, how would it feel to just like go outside for like 15 minutes? Little step, right? So mm -hmm. that's where the advertising comes in because it's the communication, it's the, it's the creative, it's the communication, it's the, it's the medium, you know, in, in understanding how to deliver that message. But you're not done, okay? So you, you give, deliver a message that gets them to be like, oh, okay, I'll take this little step. Wow, I've been looking at shadows this whole time or this feels good but now i'm in this new reality so now there's still different stages that they go through all the way through to then finally aligning with that final transformational step that your brand can deliver but we're talking about bringing people along and not for your you know, for your need for a click through rate or for your need to sell anything, it's literally adding value at every step to get them to go along. And so that's the difference between marketing and, and, and advertising from the caves perspective. Marketing is understanding their reality and advertising is speaking to their reality. Got it. This is a perfect moment to uh, to step back and reflect, and we're going to continue our conversation. I'm going to take a break for just a little bit of a sponsorship thank you for who's sponsoring our podcast today, and then we're going to pick right back up with the allegory of the cave and advertising from Plato's perspective, and uh, we're going to continue our talk with Christina Giacomo. Welcome to Pitch Up, where we make live with video easier. We've all realized how important video is for every business, but creating professional videos can be complex, expensive, and time consuming. PitchUp is here to streamline the process, so we've developed software and a service by working alongside hundreds of busy professionals who want to leverage video to grow their business. Over thousands of videos that we've produced, we've developed some great tools and consistent support to help you. First thing you need is a strong script to make sure that you cover all the important points of your video, created in advance before you hit that record button. So we've developed teleprompter software and hardware integrated with your script built directly into PitchUp. The second thing you want to include is graphics, such as captions, titles, still images, and other types of multimedia to make sure your video is more professional and it's engaging to your audience. 
Did you know that over 80% of people will watch your video with the sound off? So we can include captions for every single project. Lastly, you want to have a video editor on your side. Someone you can give detailed notes to in order to make sure your video comes together perfectly in the end. Regardless of where you decide to shoot your videos, at home, an office, a studio, or on location, we are here to support you. PitchUp is the one service that includes us all literally at your fingertips. Schedule a demo with us today so we can learn more about your business and how we can help you. You'll find the schedule link on our homepage. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Keith with the Walker team of Intero. It's May 22nd and I'm here to share how by implementing some creative strategies and cautious measures, we're able to help home buyers and sellers safely and successfully. Hey everyone, we're back. Thank you to our sponsors for hosting our podcast today. We're back with uh, Christina DiGiacomo and we're talking about the allegory of the cave, Plato's uh, philosophical works and how we can apply it to modern advertising and marketing. And right now we're just talking about, like, okay, so we've, we know that there's people in the cave and we know that there's people that are transformed because they've been through the customer journey. And now we're talking about how do we message to those people through advertising and marketing to get people back to you know, their core, their truth. Like, how do we talk about that? And where do we talk about that? So continue, please. It's really engaging. Sure. Thank you so much, Jared. Okay. So we uh, now have uh, communicated and, and walked people through, uh, through our communications to this transformational moment. And they're outside of the cave. They're aligned with your brand. They're super excited. Uh, you know, you've delivered on your promise and they're, they're feeling really good. The story doesn't end there because the allegory of the cave is circular. It's a, kind of a never ending loop in a way. And so that customer that you delivered transformation wants to go back and tell the other people in the cave their experience. So it becomes customer advocacy. So then it's what did they say to get the people in the cave to look up? And so essentially as the brand, you need to think about what gets that person to go back. So understanding why they're happy with your product or understanding how they're engaging with your brand in a really insightful way, like what gets them to go back? And then what did they actually say? At this point, the brand needs to get the heck out of the way other than enabling this conversation to happen. This is yeah. no longer about you uh, as a brand. This is about you enabling this loop and this, this uh, journey of truth to continue among your customers and enabling that and making that seamless and supporting that as a third party. So get out of the way when this starts happening. Um, exactly. Yeah. And, and actually, this is where brands get really scared because they are not in control. Their users and their uh, customers are in control now. But if they do it right, it's way more impactful to hear from other customers than from the big brand talking to you. And this is where engagement and user-generated content, things like that, come into play because 
you allow the advocates and the fans and the followers and the ambassadors and all the people that are in love with your brand to talk about you. And to be honest, that is how things get shared. It is not, I didn't see the ad for the thing a friend told me about it. I didn't see that special. Someone shared it with me. So it's like, you know, and, and it always reminds me that, you know, we're all salespeople at the end of the day because we're telling people about books and films and movies and articles and and clothing and technology that we like and things that work and we're being asked for it also. So it, it, it's so pertinent to what's happening today, especially now, especially in the last 20 years of modern advertising, including social, to get people talking. I mean, it's social media. It's about being social. It's about talking and sharing. Yeah, absolutely. I think a, a good example of this is when people get really excited about a television show, mm -hmm. right? They become fanatic about a television show. And then you see them, I mean, creating like they, they get really crafty. They create dolls of the main characters or they'll, ha they'll have a mustache like a main you're character. Gonna, you're going to laugh. Look what's sitting right in front of me. What is the that? night the night bus from Harry Potter. Oh um, yeah. And Harry Potter, you know, branding is genius in this way. And uh yeah, I mean it is everywhere around us. I I just saw someone's t shirt and it was someone I don't know and they're wearing a Game of Thrones t shirt. It said Mother of Dragons on it. And it immediately I connected with that person. There was immediate connection over, oh, we share a like of a show. We share some common interests already. We have a talking point we could talk about immediately. And I'm sure we, if we had an instant conversation, it wouldn't be perfect, but at least we'd have something of relatability to talk to. Yeah. I love this show, Bob's Burgers. I don't know if you know that show. I have seen it a few times, yes. I love that show. And there is someone who has an Instagram account where they actually make the burgers that Bob puts up on his chalkboard. Yeah. And they make the burger and they post a photograph of it. I'm obsessed with this Instagram account <laughs> because, you know, and so you never know how people are going to engage with your brand when it's out in the wild, but they become your biggest advocates only if you have had a truthful relationship with them. Only if you have brought them every single step of the way do these magical things happen. So now this is really where we talk about how can this be useful in you know in in your marketing or advertising activities and when i was referencing plato's cave in my work uh and when i was thinking about it um and and modeling off of it i just had this phrase i'm not joking i i'd say plato's cave it when i would have you know my brand planner you know, start doing insights and strategy for a, a brand extension at the New York Times, she would come to me with questions and there I could tell right away the waters were getting a bit muddy. Immediately, I would say, let's Plato's cave it. And we would walk through the process. Um, it became just a really great reminder for not only the process, but the intention of what your role is specifically throughout the marketing and advertising phases when it comes to engaging your audience, which is be truthful, step-by-step, step, allow for advocacy, and get out of the way. And, you know, um, and, and I just feel like of all people, this 2,500 year old dead guy really helped me with advertising and marketing and um, with his allegory of the cave. So uh, I hope you enjoyed that, Jared. Um, I did, thank you. And I'm not, a, uh, I'm not a study of ancient philosophers. I didn't come in with a lot of background on uh, you know, the you know, ancient Greek philosophers. I know who he is obviously, but I love to see um, something taken from the past brought into the modern context and really applied 
and that's what you do. And that's, you know, that's the work that you do. So tell people a little bit more about how companies and businesses can work with you. Sure. So I put this slide together. Um, so first, thanks everyone who's watching this. It was really a pleasure to share these ideas with you. Uh, you can connect with me on LinkedIn. This is my email address. I have a book, Wise Up at Work, uh, Manage with Calm, Navigate Obstacles and Lead the Way, which is really around how to apply uh, philosophy in your everyday working life so you could be wiser at work. Uh, I also have a podcast called Wise Up with Christina, and I bring on business leaders uh, and talk about, you know, topics and themes and we get philosophical. It's really where philosophy meets business. And I just wrapped on season one uh, and had a, a number of really incredible guests, including the SVP of technology for T-Mobile, Brian Fleming, and he and I oh, cool. nerded out on change and Heraclitus, and that was a lot of fun. <laughs> so definitely check out my podcast. And I also finally have a program where uh, called the Mental Detox. And it's a 14 day program where every day you get a video lesson on how to go from mental chatter to things that matter using philosophy and wisdom. And I also have a, a partner, Anish, who is a brain health expert. So it's wisdom and science just to kind of help you declutter your mind and get back to clarity. And it's called the mental detox. Um, and so you can check that out too, if you're interested. That's great. And we've introduced, we've uh, interviewed a niche for Zen hustlers also where entrepreneurs are trying to find balance on the edge because the journey is not, uh, it's not that clear of a journey. It's a distracting journey and it can be a really dangerous journey if you're not careful with your health and your mental health. So I love that you're tapping all these bases and you're using media leverage, which is one of the reasons why I reached out to you because I always want to show people what does it look like to be really media savvy and leverage media in a powerful and engaging way. So you have your book, you have your podcast, you have a mental detox program, and you have all the day-to-day -day work of strategy and consulting and advising that you do, um, which is really your, you know, your core expertise area. Um, but look at all the things that you're juggling. So congratulations on keeping all the balls in the air and uh, being able to deliver to different people in different ways. Because I think back to the allegory, it's that like we have to be able to speak people's languages. And some people are reading and some people are listening and some people are watching video. And it doesn't really matter the format or the medium. Um, we have to be able to deliver to that audience wherever they may be nowadays. So I just want to appreciate you for uh, not just the work that you do, but how you're delivering it to so many different audiences so that it can spread. Um, yeah. Thank you yeah. for saying that. That makes me feel that coming from you. That's such a huge compliment. Thank you, Jared. <laughs> well, it's, I mean, I have to call it out because part of our work at uh, Brickhouse Media is really giving people a model of like, well, what does it look like to be a multimedia marketing kind of expert and thought leader and it's not a one siloed event any longer um, even if one person has a, a special skill in one area say writing as I'm sure you do with your writing and your book we've got to take you out of that and and you know kind of share you in a different way that other people will be able to experience your writing because not everyone will read the book not everyone will listen to the podcast so it's like how are we going to find people where they are and the audiences will find you when they're looking. And if they're not looking, they can read a good ad or see a video ad that is attractive to them and, and shows them the shadow on the wall and gives them a new perspective for a new reality that they can share. So any, any, any final remarks? Any, what's, a, what's a quote you like? What's a great Plato quote that you like? Or a quote, not, maybe not Plato, some, uh, a famous philosopher quote that really is on the wall. You really you live by it, motivates you. So... I am a fan of this quote, which is um, the sage acts without pressure from within or without from Sri Shantananda Saraswati, who was uh, back in the 60s, the um, Shankaracharya of India, which is like super mega holy man, like philosopher, like uh, amazing. 
Um, and what I love about uh, the sage acts without pressure from within or without is because ultimately we all have to act. You know, um, I try to be very thoughtful about my thoughts. I try to very hard, but eventually, you know, we, we do have to act. So what is the right way to act? The right way to act is to act without pressure from within or without. And so that's, that's a quote that kind of keeps me going uh, and keeps me grounded. Nice. I love it. And I, and I love that it's action-based because a big part of what we do is, is not the theoretical. It is uh, getting people to take action in new kind of somewhat scary, different ways to put themselves out there as a brand or as a company. So I think it's a perfect ending. Uh, thank you for being a guest. I think anytime we can kind of expand on marketing and advertising in a new way that's a little bit different and share some new perspectives with people, that is my passion. That's why I got into advertising and marketing is I wanted to share a perspective with people that was different and unique. And it started in photography, doing it visually like the image behind me. It's not my image, but um, it's just a stock of, it's about sharing something that gets you to take action and gets you motivated um, outside of just the theoretics world, which I'm sure is a big part of your work. So I appreciate your contributions today. And uh, if you have any questions, you can reach out to Christina here. There's all our contact information. We'll put links below uh, when we share the video. So I'm going to wrap with today. Enjoy uh, a fall in New York. It's one of my favorite places in the world to be in uh, this time of the year. And I hope I get to talk to you really soon. Thank you so much, Jared. And thank you, everyone. Bye. You're welcome. Any questions, reach out to me at uh, bhmedia.co and let us know how we can support your journey as a thought leader. Okay, take care all.